regeneration again, and some of the other things that you've already heard about several times today. Um, of course, every oak regeneration study comes up with a different result. So, and I'm from UT, so nearby, close to the Smokies. And this study was designed with um, a few specific questions in mind. One, well, do those sprouts uh, from those root systems dominate in those high severity areas? So that's kind of um, expected. But you know, you can see in this photo there are a lot of seedlings as well. Um, so is it those, the sprouts from existing roots or is it seedlings that will dominate? And which species is that going to favor? You know, some species sprout very well and others don't at all, uh, or don't very well. Next is, does that low severity fire promote oak regeneration? Million dollar question, right? And do the effects of a prescribed fire differ from that of a wildfire in promoting oak regeneration? And then uh, we're also looking at the scars. So we're looking at fire scars of those standing trees. Um, so what's the prevalence and does that cause you know, delayed mortality? And of course, you know, we typically think that the larger diameter a tree is, the less likely it is to be scarred. Um, does that hold true across species or not? And so we had a number of sites. Some of them are, you can see a cluster that's a prescribed fire site it's over there in the, the left-hand side and some from the wildfire on the right-hand side. So we have two groups. All, both groups have low severity uh, controls and a high severity fire. You'll notice the, the dates are a little bit different. So we've got you know, one stand that's a little bit older than the other. Um, so just keep that in mind and also they're burned at different times of year. So, you know, it's, a, it's a, probably the best comparison we could get, but, you know, just keep in mind that the dates are different. Okay, so we were measuring 10th acre plots. Um, and the first thing we had to do was quantify the fire intensity. So we're coming in after the fact and looking at, you know, what's there. Well, we need to know on that particular plot, you know, how intense was the fire? Well, we can kind of maybe guess um, using scorch height, and then we can look at the fire severity by tree mortality is a good one. We also considered using litter and duff when we did make a bunch of litter and duff measurements. But at this point, it was about nine months later, we found absolutely nothing. As you heard you know, earlier, there's not always a relationship there. And the next was to quantify that injury to live trees. So here we're looking at the cambial death. So the, the cambium of the tree lies right underneath the bark. It's the living part um, that's between the wood and the bark and that's producing all the new wood and the new phloem that carries the sugars down to the roots. And it is pretty heat sensitive, so um, you can actually tell this was the perfect timing to look at that fire scar formation and cambial injury because after about uh, uh, eight months or so, the rest of the cambium starts to grow and you'll see it kind of swelling up. But the part that's dead will be sunken a little bit. Okay, so we're looking for these sunken spots. Um, sometimes they have some fungus on them, some loose bark. Those are dead giveaways. But often the bark is still intact and lying over the wound, but you can tell um, the extent of that injury on the tree. So we're quantifying that. We looked at the circumference of the 
that scar on the tree or the dead cambium, and also the height of that injury. Um, then we looked at the number of basal sprouts. So generally where you've got a, a cambial injury, you get sprouts coming from the base. Um, often the more injured the tree is, the more sprouts you get. And then we looked at regeneration. So we're looking at how many sprouts there are, and that's both on live trees and dead trees. Um, how many seedlings there are. And then we also looked at the distance to the nearest living oak, the distance in the species. Um, it turned out that that was really irrelevant because anybody know what the average dispersal distance of an oak is? No? close to a kilometer, half a mile. It's a long way um, because it, they're carried by animals. And so every plot that we had had a number of different oak species within that distance. So this turned out to be not very helpful. Okay, so then we took our results and we originally had these plots based on the maps. Um, fire severity maps, but then looking at the, the mortality and the scorch height, we reassigned them. Um, you know, fire is always patchy, and so we had some areas that might have been in a larger area that showed up as being a low severity, but it was a high severity patch. And so these are reassigned. Okay, so then looking at the regeneration. So here's our first question. Does the regeneration from sprouts dominate in those high severity burn areas? Well, not quite, but you'll notice that in the other areas, so in the control, the, lo the low and the moderate intensity, or moderate severity fires, we've got mostly seedlings. But in the high severity fire, we've got um, a lot of sprouts. So we've got equal numbers of sprouts and seedlings. Okay, so there, the sprouts aren't dominating, but you all have probably watched a sprout grow versus a seedling. They've already got the root system there. And if you put a sprout and a seedling of the same species next to each other, the sprout's almost always gonna win. You know, it can put all of its energy into height growth. It's all already got those roots. And so if they're equal in number here, we can expect that those sprouts are probably going to be the winners. Now, if you look at oak seedlings, they're a pretty small percentage of all seedlings in all of those, um, particularly in the, the high. Okay, so then what species? And the high severity fire, so this is the number of sprouts per tree. In the low severity fire, we've got a lot of chestnut oak producing a lot of sprouts and also northern red oak, sorry, in the high severity fire. In the high severity areas, the Virginia pine, and Virginia pine, did you know it sprouts? So does Table Mountain Pine. They actually do. They produce quite a few sprouts. But not as many as the oaks. And so in the long run, well, it's hard to say which one's going to win, but um, chestnut oak, northern red oak, Virginia pine all sprout prolifically, as does Table Mountain Pine. White oak, black oak, not so much. Red maple, of course, you all know how well that sprouts. And it sprouts in all different intensities of fire. Then it gets sprouts. Of course, we've got a little bit different species composition in those high severity burn areas. And so these are the, the number of sprouts per stem of the most common species there. Of course, red maple. Chestnut oak, we found a chestnut oak, one chestnut oak stem that had 214 sprouts coming out of it. 
<laughs> so, you know, that's a lot of stems. Of course, you know, all of them will die off except one or two maybe, but it's still occupying a fairly large space on that site. Okay, so thinking again about what species are favored, we've got these sprouts and looking at the seedlings. So we've got seed rain coming in from, you know, across the area. And in the control, we've got mostly shade tolerant species establishing and intermediate species, that's what you'd expect. In those really open sites, severely burned sites. Interestingly, it wasn't the shade intolerant species that were establishing. It was the shade tolerant ones. I don't have an explanation for this yet. But those shade intolerant species, if that's what you're trying to get, it looks like that low severity fire is favoring those early successional species. Okay, so what about sprouting by tree age? You know, typically we think that a younger tree is going to sprout um, more prolifically, and it, it usually does. You've got some fairly large trees here that are producing sprouts, and so they will continue to produce sprouts as they get older. But there is a definitely a relationship there. Okay, so comparing prescribed fire with wildfire. And this is taking into account fire severity or both a scorch height and overstory mortality. I couldn't find any significant differences between the two when it came to regeneration. So that's, say so nothing was significant. Does Low severity fire promote oak regeneration? Well, no. Here, in this case, it doesn't yet. Doesn't yet. But we see low oak regeneration is really low in all of these plots. So it doesn't seem to. However, we've got, if you look at the mortality, of course, the, the really high severity plots, we've got high mortality of everything. But if you look at those moderate and the lows, you've got a lot of survival of those oaks, the northern red oak and chestnut. Black oak, we only found one that had a scar on it, and that was in the high severity fire. They seem to, to tolerate anything, the black oaks where a lot of the other species, and these are only species that were present in all of the stands, or in all of the plots I'm showing here. So other species had a much higher mortality rate. So we're left with a lot of standing oaks, right? When the other species are dead, we've got light on the ground. And so I think those standing oaks, because they're, they survived, they've got now a good, um, seed bed for regeneration. Now they probably have an advantage. So it'll be interesting to see how they do. Part of the reason for all of the, the differences that we see in the oak regeneration and, and fire studies may be related to the time of year. Um, acorns are very sensitive to heat. And so if the acorns have fallen and they're on the ground when it's burned, they're not going to survive. Okay. Um, but if the, in this case, we had the fire when some of the acorns were still on the trees, and so the species are going to differ here too. If the acorns are still on the trees, they drop after the fire, you've got a great seed bed for them. So I think timing can be really crucial for oak regeneration. Okay, so looking at the, the prevalence and size of fire scars. And 
You can see the oaks, we had just a few dead. We had probably half of them are scarred and quite a few intact. Um, red maple, on the other hand, we've got a lot dead. Very few really scarred and quite a few intact. So this is a percentage, but now if, but we have a whole lot more red maple there to start with. So if we look at actual numbers, um, we've still got a lot more red maple. And this is the, the percentage of the circumference of the tree that was actually scarred. So what's the cambial death? You'll notice that on those, the chestnut oak and the northern red oak, so those are the two that sprouted really well. They're scarred, but only about 30% of the circumference. You know, normally we think 30% is a good cutoff if something's gonna die if you get a, an injury larger than that, but that's not true for all species. Where red maple has a much greater um, scarring, even at those low severity fires. And so does white oak, actually. Even in its scarring, even at the low severity fires. So is there a relationship between fire scars and the size of those scars with the size of the tree. For oaks, there is. It's not a really strong relationship, but it's significant. So yes, larger oaks, less likely to be injured, less likely to have fire scars. For red maple, there was no relationship between size and scarring. And we went out in March 2020. So this is a follow-up to that one I showed you a little bit earlier. We've got now the dead oaks, go back. Okay, look at this one. You've got a few oaks, you've got half the red maple are dead, and half of them are intact, right? Okay, this is a couple of years later, most of the red maple are dead. The rest are scarred. There's hardly any that are intact. So things have really changed for red maple over the past couple of years. Unfortunately, we started to collect this data set and it's incomplete because guess what happened? Um, so we're gonna go back out and collect more data on this now that we're, we're up and running again. The oaks, almost all of them are scarred but very few are dead. So they seem to, even if they've got a really large scar, they can have, you know, half of their cambium is dead, they persist. So they're still there and they're producing acorns. So I think in the long run, you know, we don't really have a good answer yet from the study on whether fire is promoting oak regeneration, but this really suggests that, that um, the persistence of oak might play a role in it. If we look at the prevalence of fire scars in relation to tree size across all species, there's really no relationship. So it's only for a very few species like the oaks. So with that, I'd like to thank um, some of the National Parks folks, um, Paul Super, Rob Klein, and Russell Fulcher, who helped me with the GIS stuff. And then, of course, the field technicians, uh, Jocelyn Knox and Matt Aldervandi, who was a graduate student at the time, and he's now working for the Tennessee Division of Forestry.